Heavenly Father, I humbly beseech you to see before you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a sinner of your own redeeming. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. It is good to be with you on this anniversary uh, with those who are gathering uh, with us in uh, person and also those who are online with us. Uh, And it is my pleasure to offer uh, a word uh, on our gospel this morning. In this moment that we find ourselves in in this country, in this time, uh, with so much swirling around us, we could probably all make a big list of those things. What must we be freed from is the question our gospel poses for us. What must we be freed from so that we may embrace God's invitation to draw closer to God and to one another? Our gospel today speaks of God's liberation, in particular how we are liberated from the sin and brokenness of this world to be who God has made us to be. The passage offers a bit of, big word you could use, eschatological imagination. In other words, a view of God's kingdom yet to come. In other words, to imagine with Christ what God is doing for us, how we might be released, and our role in the work of the kingdom of God might be undertaken. We're invited today in our context to see our present moment through the eyes of the past and in particular through the eyes of Scripture. The gospel invites us to consider how the powers of this world, powers that demand political conviction, powers that require faithfulness to worldly structures, pull us from God's invitation to be part of God's kingdom, God's reign and mission We're not told what Jesus is teaching in this passage, though elsewhere in Mark, we're pretty sure. Along with the other Gospels, we might be sure that the core is this. We are to love God and to love neighbor, and that Christ comes to unbind those who are bound, to heal the sick and give sight to the blind. It is clear that Christ comes to draw us closer to God and to each other. They go hand in hand. The passage invites us to consider what happens when the word of God may come into conflict with the powers of this world, uh, those we, you and I, bind ourselves to, how, uh, or how God's word comes into conflict with identities, if you will, that we commit ourselves to. The powers of this world, structures, political, and I. Uh, identifiable, manifested in the world, do not typically draw us closer to God and closer to one another. In fact, the power is known by its capacity to draw you to it and its capacity to divide us and to to encourage us to seek this tribe or another tribe's best interests. Powers turn us against one another. And they seek to scapegoat whoever they have defined as the other. That's how it works. And as I wrote those words, I began to become very curious about the commitments and allegiances to the worldly tribes and powers that I have made. I figure if I'm preaching to myself, somebody in here might need to hear it too. And how I'm drawn from the love of other and from the love of God by them. So I might ask myself, what must I be liberated from? How is Christ inviting me on this day to be free? By Christ and his cross, we are liberated to lean towards each other and God in new ways, to seek what is good for the whole and to be curious about human flourishing beyond my own individual flourishing. Christ brings the powers of this world into us as individuals and communities, a higher rule of life. I'm aware in myself, and as I observe others, that when Christ challenges me, we all too easily go into defense mode. We double down 
on our earthly commitments. In fact, while I'm saying this, I'm doubling down and you probably are too. So hold on. (laughs) Ideologies and political allegiances are powerful. But what they reveal is that we believe they will save us. And not Christ himself. This is very short-sighted indeed. Especially in the face at this moment of eternal life. The man in the gospel offers examples of how the powers of politics, culture, and allegiance make us quick to defend our earthly choices against Christ's challenge. The man says, what have you to do with us? This is the first defense against the liberating cross of Christ. Since it's been a while since I've been here, you might be thinking that too. What have you to do with us? (laughs) I can't wait for you to be gone again. (laughs) We pray for you, Bishop. Like the czar, that you may be far from us at all times. You see, the man suggests Jesus and God have nothing to do with the way we live in the world. That faith, our faith and religion are private and don't have anything to order our lives. Such a challenge to the gospel seeks, we need to understand, it seeks to remove God's concern about God's creation from the world itself where our true loyalty lies, and God's concerns for how we live with each other. God, in point of fact, has everything to do with that and is very interested indeed. So we have the incarnation, do we not? The second defense that the man alleges is that such commitment to God or others above our commitment to the worldly loyalties will destroy us. This, too, the man states clearly. Both are allegations of fear. Expresses the fear, both human and institutional, that if we we were to live by the commandment to love God and love one another, everything would fall apart. (laughs) The institutions, the political, even our human desires. For power over others is intense. And we believe it would be diminished if we were to start living our faith in the world around us. These allegations by the man are what you and I echo all too quickly when we want to maintain our beliefs in worldly powers and not claim the faith that God invites us to in God's power. Both are allegations made in order to keep God's kingdom at bay against Christian faith against maintaining human flourishing for our own. These defenses further allow us to use God to support whatever we want, while the church and individuals of faith are silenced. These allegations support an idea that God cannot act in the world and that we must do it ourselves. This is nothing less than idolatry. These defenses compartmentalize our faith and diminish our commitment to Christ. But in the end, Jesus unbinds the man. Worldly power will not be victorious in the face of Christ. Doesn't matter what you think. Christ is going to win. Christ will unbind us. And I'll tell you, it's a lot better if Christ unbinds us in this world than having to wait till we get unbound in the next. Christ's crucifixion is victorious. Christ's giving of himself offers a vision of our acts, moves and reveals and releases the man. You and I both know our hearts. And we should feel discomforted (laughs) but that's what happens when we hear the gospel the gospel asks us to change our lives it invites us to commit ourselves to a new way of being together it is the discomfort of the liberating power of jesus you must by now see that god (laughs) will not let you go God's not going to let you go. God will keep entering your private holy places. 
Christ keeps coming again and again, asking us to follow, inviting us, especially in Mark's gospel. And we're going to read it all year long. So you're going to hear this constantly. Jesus is going to keep coming, saying, follow the way. Follow me. Be my disciples. Now, when the first group of faithful gathered on January of 1896 in the old opera house on West Seeley Street, Charles Beckwith was there. No communion to be seen on that day. <laughs> Evening prayer. Wasn't the fifth Sunday, quite obviously. <laughs> they did so, I believe. Now, th think about this. They did so choosing to set about, intentionally, to set about God's work in Alvin. To follow Jesus here. To serve the neighbors here. To be an icon of God at work here. I believe they did so with the intention that an Episcopal community in Alvin would draw people closer to God and to one another. I don't think God's finished with you. <laughs> I don't think God has decided to give up on this church. You still have a mission. And it is the same mission. No matter what comes politically, pandemically, or in the hour of our lives, we have a mission. One here in Alvin. And it is a mission to invite others to receive the freedom that we receive by the liberating cross of Christ in this place. We are invited to live lives in communities where the Holy One of God is present, alive and proclaimed. God invites us to imagine different loyalty and a different commitment. One that is freed from worldly promises, but one that is founded upon the liberating love of Jesus on his cross. And in so doing, I believe, no matter where we find ourselves today, I believe that in so doing and trying to do this work, we, you and I, will struggle. But we will in the end draw closer to God and to our neighbor. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.